you very much. Um, our next speaker doesn't really need a lot of introduction, uh, Paul Abiak, um, and he is going to be uh, talking about the first publicly available version of the I2B2 Transmart platform. So, Paul. For this opportunity, um, uh, to present the work that uh, we have been doing, and and to finally announce uh, uh, and how uh, within a, a year we actually managed to uh, to do it. And so, what I wanted to do today is to take the opportunity uh, to first present to give a very short history. Hi. 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 Yeah. It's not just my French accent. Okay. <laughs> so the um, before showing you the uh, this new public version of I2B2 Transmart, uh, I first wanted to do a very short history of what I2B2 and what Transmart are in order to, to understand the context of why this needed to be done. So first as I2B2 that was created by Zach, Sean, and Suzanne, now what, uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, based on RPDR working on partners, creating the first open source uh, version with, which was available, to, and that enabled to put together all the different layers of information around patients, where it first focused with EHR data, but many different other sources of knowledge like registry data, patient report of outcome, clinical trials were able to be integrated, and now even uh, genomics data, into this stack of uh, knowledge. Where in 2010, there were uh, 150 sites that were using I2B2, and as, from my, my perspective, the most important uh, uh, fact about I2B2 is on this page of the website. If you haven't done it already, go on this page, i2b2.gov.org slash disease. Yes. Okay, it was a great page. I hope that Google, <laughs> I hope that Google stole it forever. Yes, that's, that, that's, okay, we'll update this because that's a crucial thing. This is, there's more than 500 or 600 research papers that came out of, so real research papers, not just infrastructure, of using the I2B2 infrastructure for real to advance biomedical research. So that's a key element to be able to show that it's useful. It's not just yet another data database. It's something that was actually extremely useful. And so uh, what happened is Transmart came along. Where Transmart, where Eric Paraclis, which is in the room, I think, yes he is, uh, what he did um, in uh, around 2007, when he, were, he was the CIO of uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, working with Recombinant, uh, with uh, Dan Arsman, that worked on creating, taking the I2B2 database model that was open source, and adding an application layer on top of it, on top of the actual I2B2 application, to be able to create the Transmart platform that was first internal with in uh, uh, JNJ, and then that became open source on the 24th of January 2012. I remember that date because I had a master student working, where, and we were trying with the lawyers of JNJ, uh, uh, my hospital, my former hospital in Paris, to have an early access to the code. But because JNJ was asking to have the full data that we'll be using in our instance, so that won't work. So after six months, I was desperate in order to have an early version to be able to see this Transmart uh, platform that I was only seeing in Eric's papers. And but then on the 24th of January, we got access so we could download it. So the first version was the 0 0.9 version of Transmart that was publicly available. And, uh, but the issue, there wasn't everything that came from the JNJ plat internal platform. So they created this open source version, but that was very, very tough and difficult to install, difficult to use. And uh, the first version that we managed to really use was the 1.0 hotfix. And you'll see why this number is important. 
because that this one came along in um, in uh, at the end of 2012, and we were able to load our data to be able to reproduce some of our analysis by integrating rare cancer, primary cancer, uh, to be able to redo this analysis to show as a proof of concept that it was working, uh, and then Transmark was very naturally part of the framework in this context of the i2b2 world with the interconnection of all the tools having so this is uh, the vision where you have i2b2 as this database model to be able to have to do the advanced cork selection being linked to the shrine network led by Doug uh, McFadden who is also in the room who enables you have multiple i2b2 instances but also linked to smarts were and now smart on fire led by Ken to be able to have uh, one level the patient lookup and Transmart that came in this environment being with the same I2B2 instance where you could have advanced statistical tools by bank data by an explorer using the Transmart uh, system so everything was working fine but then something bad happened in the context of the evolution and this happens in the context of open source development where with the, uh, the the big European uh, funded project Etrix, they decided to remove the I2B2 software from Transmart. So they kept the I2B2 tables. So the I2B2 tables were still there, but the software that was created by Sean's team, uh, by Mark, Laurie, by everyone from his team was taken away. So there wasn't the JBoss application of I2B2 anymore. In starting from the Transmart version 1.1. So, yes, it was working. There were many users on that, but they weren't all the functionalities that you could do with I2B2. And so, because th and that's where there's a misconception saying, hey, but in Transmart 1.1, there was still I2B2. No, there wasn't the software. There were still the tables, but not the software anymore. And why there were many reasons why this happened, but then uh, this was a huge fork. So there was really two communities, the I2B2 community and the Transmart community. And then exactly five years ago, I arrived as a postdoc in uh, Zach's lab and uh, tried to work hard, where being as close as possible. Uh, uh, and that's where Ben, who's my, the landlord, is also in the room right now. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so I had a small room to be able to work in. The, and the, 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 the first assignment was exactly five years ago to how to from the, and I'm sure Zach doesn't remember, but how to, in Transmart, we could enable the meta-analysis functionality that was broken. So that was my first assignment, but then very quickly said, okay, that's useless, and then let's work on using it to, for real, not just to create the tool, but let's integrate all the autism data he had available, all the clinical data, all the genomic data, into one central platform. And so that was exactly five years ago when I arrived, and now today, we, it's whatever I'll be presenting is the work, not just of a full team, a full team uh, of and the software developers and half of the team being also uh, data scientists, postdocs and students that have been working in order to deliver at the end what you will have available as this pub public version of I2B2 Transmart. So throughout the years, what we've been doing is to use this old version of Transmart, the 1.0 hotfix that was working from Transmart that still had I2B2. We upgraded the I2B2 software, but we didn't want. And all of the previous demos, all the previous projects that we used was using this old version of Transmart that was starting to get old, but we had the latest version of I2B2, but this old version of Transmart that still had a connection with I2B2, with the I2B2 core software. And so, as Zach uh, point, uh, pointed out, what we've been working on is uh, across multiple cloud vendors with Amazon and Google, uh, and now starting also with uh, Azure, to try to, uh, to create HIPAA compliant environment where there's multiple modules that enables interconnected using API and create using the picture API that we created that enables to have patient level genomic and, and, and uh, genomic data, clinical and genomic data available to create an ecosystem because there's not one tool that fits all. The user interface of I2B2 Transmart won't enable you to write, to write a full paper. It's just to generate hypothesis, to be able to explore the data, to have a sense of how many patients you have. And 
in order to run the full analysis, because there's no point of trying to do all the analysis and trying to in incorporate all the analysis tool in the user interface, there will be always parameters that you want to tweak. So that's why going and using the, the full power of Jupyter Notebooks that enables to create the full pipeline of how you want to run the analysis and what we are making available is templates of how examples of, of how you can run the analysis and then you can change it. You can change how you want to tweak the parameters based on your need, based on your study. Because there's definitely not one tool that fits all in the context of doing a biomedical research. So it's really to have a set of tools. So there's, yes, there was IQB2 at the beginning, but there's not just IQB2, there's many other tools that enable to scale. And so for example, we've been testing so many different variant stores that uh, to be able to have, to, to scale up uh, of having thousands and tens of thousands of full genome. And that's where now we are really focusing on HAL, HAL cluster created by the world that enables and really are using the, the Google Cloud right now to be able to scale up uh, and create giant clusters that enable us to run the analysis of genotype phenotype correlation. And so where one of the, the I2B to really enable us to create this baseline phenotype, taking data, any different source of data from the same patients, because at the end, we are all unique. We, are, we can't have, we, we don't have an USB plug to be able to extract all the data from us. It's only by a proxy, a proxy of a research a protocol or real life data from the EHR that you only have a proxy of what is going on around a patient. And what, what, what is now enabled is to have this baseline phenotype around a patient by putting together all the different sources of data. And we do the same with the genotype data from a sample to create all those baseline phenotype and then based on a very specific study to extract derived phenotype, computer, computational phenotypes, or derived genotype loss, loss of function, missense mutations, to be able to do those genotype phenotype interaction. And so it's really depending on what use case, but at least what those tools enable you is to create those baseline phenotype, baseline genotype, and then per research study to go down and do this iteration. So uh, uh, NIH BD2K project that has been going on for the past four years, led by Zach and Sean and Suzanne, was one of the uh, focus of this project, but there's many others, was to create this picture API that enabled to, uh, to uh, something that was missing is when you want to run analysis, you don't want to always download the full data. And so what we created was to be able to go and pick and select only the variables of interest. And I'll show you an example, so that you don't have to download everything because the data is so huge now. It's really to go and select either the clinical data. And so we started the model using the I2B2 example, but it's not just about I2B2. Picture is not just about I2B2. We took this first example for the clinical data, but we have clinical data in other database models than I2B2. And also to have the variance. So the variance, where we try with CIDB, with Oracle, with Genome, and now using HAL to be able to have the full interconnected system across the multiple system, and also making the link with not patient level data, like aggregate data, like EXAC and, and um, uh, norm ad And so to, you can, any patient level or aggregated level data can be integrated using the picture API. So now I'll show you three examples where we, that I haven't shown uh, last year, of projects that are using this picture API at, at scale. And so the picture API, which is, and you will see it, a, a key component where we made the link for this uh, early, so the public version of I2B2 Transmart. And the, one of the uh, projects, the NIH Data Commons that also Zach mentioned, where it's at a national scale to create fair computational tool for a national scale conduct of biomedical research, where we are working uh, uh, across many, with many different teams within this consortium. And one of our a research project, a scientific research project, is to automatically classify pathologic versus benign variation associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy across ancestral diverse population. And so in order to answer to this very specific use case, we are integrating thousands of patients from many different research cohorts, like the Framingham Heart Study that has more than 
60,000 clinical viables this, in this registry with 15,000 patients with all genome, not exome, with all genome sequencing data available around all those patients in this platform. And so that's what we are making available to integrate all the clinical data into I2B2 transplant, all the sequencing data in health, and everything is linked using the picture meta API that enables to make the link between the different systems. And then you can access it either by the user interface of I2B2 transmart or by the Jupyter notebooks showing example of, and I'll show you how it looks like, where you can run your analysis, go and select the variables of interest for the clinical data or the genomic data. So, and because someone is going to ask the question, can you access HAIL and make queries today in I2B2 transmart user interface? Not today, but tomorrow. We are at the, the final stage of making this available. So from the user interface of the I2B2 Transmart 18.1 that we just released a month ago, in the 18.2, you will be able to make the queries that will make picture call to the HAIL cluster. So this is working uh, already, uh, but we are de definitely working to make sure that it works at scale, at scale when we have tens of thousands of full genomes and not just a few uh, patients. So within this consortium, what the uh, NIH data common, where there's 10 funded different teams, where we are, uh, where Zach is in charge of all the API framework across this consortium of looking how to biomedical research and access to clinical data and clinical and genomic data at scale will be done and delivered by the NIH looking at the, the landscape of all the APIs with all the different functions that are available. And the picture API is present at three different levels. First, as a file level API to go and download data as one file, but then the variant level API to go and pick and select the vari clinical variables of interest to be able to run the analysis, but also as a meta API to be able to call and invoke other APIs to be able to make the link between many different systems. So it's uh, different functionalities that are made available. And one of the important components for re reproductable science is by the context of Jupyter Notebooks, is to have this framework, this model, this template of how to run the full analysis and to publish this so that someone else will be able to do it. And we even now put it in the abstract of our publications. So looking at, for example, in PubMed, we are putting the Jupyter notebook in the abstract so that when someone reads the abstract by browsing in PubMed, even before opening and accessing the paper, he will see that he will be able to reproduce the analysis. That's something key because today, and I, I just received this, uh, there's uh, the Jupyter Con conference where last year there was 1.3 million Jupyter notebooks in GitHub. This year, there's 2.6 million Jupyter notebooks in GitHub. Here, there's two of them right there out of the 2.6 million. But in order to make sure that people are aware of it, we want to make to show them so that uh, 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 this will be used differently and in a context of uh, reproductible science so that we can actually reduce, anyone can redo the analysis. And does an, this analysis, there will be a workshop and I'll talk about it later, and you'll be able to redo part of this analysis tomorrow if you come to uh, Alba's uh, workshop. And what we mean by the picture API, so this is an example where there's two slides showing you three slides from the Jupyter notebook. What we mean by the picture API, for example here that we are making access uh, from the URL, the authentication being here, and then I can go and select to pick and choose only the variables of interest I want in my analysis. So I don't have to download the full clinical data in the notebook in the R environment before running the analysis. And then instead of downloading, because the full clinical data is more than one gigabyte, here in this case, I'm only downloading 144 kilobytes because I'm only selecting four, eight clinical variables. So to have something that work at scale with clinical, and genomic data, and once it's in your research environment, then you are in R and you can do whatever you want. So this was the first example of picture that is now being used at a national scale 
to be, and the another example is how to use the picture as the backbone, uh, at the back end, to be able to create new user interface on top of I2B2, where the uh, Dana Farber Cancer Institute is uh, actively working with us to create this new user interface on top of I2B2 using the picture API layer to enable to uh, uh, make other types of query to create a more modern user interface on top of it. So we organized not one, but two hackathons using the picture API, one more focus on the data, the other one focus in September, last September, was on creating new user interface uh, using the picture API. And so uh, this was one of the success where this is, uh, last year we presented markups, now we, there's definitely a, a first uh, internal version to be able to access the clinical data. And then the third project I wanted to show you, led by Ken Mandel, is in the context of putting together the three leading pediatric hospital in US, CHOP, Cincinnati, and Boston Children's Hospital, where the Genomic Research Innovation Network, one of the components of this project led by and, uh, and uh, approved at the CEO level across those three hospitals, is to enable to share all, that, all the data from those three institutions. And so we're using, again, the picture API to make the link between the three different institutions, the clinical data and the genomic data, into a HIPAA compliant environment. So we presented uh, a live demo to the three CEOs a month ago, and it was great, where we created also a new portal, a new user interface, so yet another one. That's the key point of the modularity of using an API. You can create many different user interfaces based on your need. And so that's where we, where we did, created a design sprint in, for the context of the uh, Biobank at Boston Children's Hospital to then create this new Google-like user interface to be able to explore clinical and genomic data at scale, looking at what is the best user interface today for searching Google. So this all key point was to have a search box where you can type anything to be able to retrieve any kind of clinical and genomic data. So for example, typing epilepsy and recurrent seizures, automatically calculating the number of patients, and this is querying the Cincinnati database with more than 1 million patients in less than five seconds to then retrieve this information and to also, and that's the key point, to be able to query the genomic data. So not to have pre-configured ontology. So when you have a pre-configured ontology in your system, then you are stuck with what is in your ontology. What we created is you can query any variance by the coordinates but to be able to select to see if there's a patient. So there's not a hard ontology that tells you what you can query. So to create something at scale, to be able to find how many variants there are within the system. And so based on this, based on the I2B2 transmart and now having the picture API working at scale to retrieve data, we wanted to make the, the public version of the, uh, uh, of the I2B2 transmart to use a, a big data set. And as a big data set of clinical data, what we wanted is using with Hirak Patel, we worked with the CDC Enhanced National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where this database contains more than 41,000 individuals with 1,200 clinical variables and environmental patient level variables per individual. So it's a 20 gigabyte database in Oracle that enables to, and this is public, completely publicly available. It was created by downloading more than 300 Excel sheets from the CDC website, everything integrated in I2B2 Transmart. And what we made available for youth to be able to, in the quick start of use and using and installing I2B2 Transmart was to have this 20, gig, 20 gigabyte database as the default database that you can use. So you can all get this by, and I'll show you, four lines of code to have the full I2B2 Transmart installed on your laptop with this full database being installed. And so my developers got mad at me saying, hey, why don't you use a smaller database? Because this is huge. And the, what we realized is when we were putting as a standard, as the default of a database with so many real patients, so this is not fake patients, this is real data used in so many different publications as the default of not having just tens of patients, but to have 
40,000 patients as the default, that's where we, was, we were saying that this was scale. Because you don't see the same problems when you have 10 patients and when you have millions of patients. So that's why we really wanted so the downside of the quick install on your laptop is you need to have 120 gigabytes of space disk on your hard drive or on your laptop. Or if you don't, you can definitely install it on the cloud. It works exactly the same way. But at least you have all these data set available now in this uh, system. And so that way you'll be able, and we'll show you also in detail tomorrow during the workshop, of how you can access, make queries across the system and directly using this system. So now, getting to the point, we, the, the title was the public version of I2B2 Transmart. So we called 18.1 using the Apache numbering because I was asked, how come you are 18 when you haven't had that first one? So 18 is the year 2018 and the first release of 2018. That's why it's called the 18.1. What we've been doing in, uh, at DBMI is to have the latest version of I2B2 where we were keeping and updating based on all the hard work of Sean's team. But then we were still using the old version of Transmart, the one that was five years old the one that is the 1.0 hotfix. And then we made a lot of improvement throughout the years with all the developers to be able to get the HIPAA compliance secured on the web and all that, and to have something working at scale. So it was working great, but it was using this old version of Transmart. We didn't want to go with the, the and following up with what the Transmart Foundation was, was doing with the 1.1, 1.2 and all that, because there was, I2B2 that was completely taken out, the I2B2 software. So that's why our, we've been using our internal version of I2B2 Transmart called the 1.0 hotfix and then with an internal numbering number. And then that's where we created the I2B2 Transmart PMC with project management uh, uh, committee to then work and define how could we put together in the context from many different teams to be able to uh, create a roadmap, and you have the link to this roadmap, of how to put back those platforms. And one of the key elements that we realized is we had to use Docker. We had to use Docker at scale to be able to have something using microservices so that every single component of the platform, every single tool, had to be Dockerized. If it wasn't Dockerized, it wasn't part of the system. We tried using Docker Data Center as something to protect our, our environment. That didn't work. It's definitely not ready for production from Docker. So we're using Docker Community Edition, and it's working uh, great in order to separate the components. And then with the help of uh, Suzanne and Zach from the Department uh, of uh, Biomedical Informatics, we were able to hire someone full-time, uh, Bert. I don't know if Bert is in the room. He's working. So where we hired a, a new, a dedicated individual who is a full stack Rails developer because Transmart was created using Rails um, Java language. And so Bert wrote the book on Rails, the O'Reilly book. So, I mean, that's on the CV helps, you know, do you know Rails. And so it, because there was definitely a huge need to improve the code and of Transmart and making the link to do it the right way. So throughout the past 12 months, what happened is this. To take the latest version of I2B2, the one that you can download out of the box from i2b2.org website, and then to take the latest version of Transmart in production, used by many people around here, the 16.2, the version 16.2, and then all, so the starting point was really to take the Transmart, the 16.2 the, the version. So we didn't take one line of code for the very old version of Transmart. We took this, the latest version of Transmart, the 16.2, and then we made a lot of changes in order to improve it, to be able to get, uh, and so uh, to then be do this integration with I2B2 and using Docker and having something fully interoperable. If you go on the roadmap document, you'll see all the changes that happened, but the five main bullet points that happened in the past year, the, to go from the Transmart 16.2 to the Transmart that we 
have in the 18.1, what we did is to upgrade to the latest version of Grails, Servlet API 3 and Java 8. And then there was an extensive code cleanup for consistency performance amplification to remove everything that was deprecated and use duplicated code. And then to do the real compatibility with the I2B2 web services and the integration also of the Fractalis uh, plugin uh, using the picture API to retrieve the data and then to also propose the optional support for the O0.com authentication mechanism. So this is optional, but you can have access to it in the quick start. Why? Because for the HIPAA compliance, we couldn't use the login mechanism that is by default in Transmart or I2B2. We had to create and reuse one on top of it. Uh, so that's why we use the audio.com system authentication federated mechanism. And uh, we had to build this in. And then the summary changes of the I2B2, the core I2B2, the 1.7.09, where there's only one changes that happen right now is to the uh, performance improvement of the uh, PDO queries to retrieve patient table data, because now that we're using this at scale, connecting to the picture API, where we see that there's a small change that needs to happen to be able to uh, integrate at scale. So this is this um, pull request is still under review. Uh, that's what we, the patch that we did for our version and the version that you will be downloading. But that's what we, because we really want to have the core version of the latest version, and that's what will be working, of I2B2 in production, and the latest version of Transmart in production, the 16.2. We don't want to have any other version that is not yet in production and approved by the foundation, because we really want to make sure that this is working at scale. And so what we've been doing and what today you can have access where this 18.1 beta release that we released a month ago is available here on GitHub, on the I2B2 Transmart uh, GitHub repo. And one of the key points that, uh, because I had, it took us, it took me five or uh, four months the first time that I wanted to install Transmart and a month when I wanted to install uh, I2B2 um, uh, five years ago. And so we wanted to have something very, very, very easy to install, to get started. That was one of the key components. And so we created one script, a Docker Compose script, that will go and coop and enable. And so that's an outstanding work, outstanding work done by Andre, who is in the, in the room, who created one script that do the full interconnection between all your Docker images, all your deployment of all your Docker components. Because if you try to put everything into the same Docker image, then you haven't understood what microservices means. So we have many different Docker images that are fully interconnected. And there's one script that enables to have automatically the latest version of I2B2 in production, the latest version of Transmart in production, then the BD2K picture API also installed, the CTC enhanced with 41,000 patients locally installed in a, a, a Docker environment. So working closely with Docker throughout the years, what we realized is today, there's no Docker database in production. Why? It's still too dangerous, too volatile. It can disappear at any second. So what this, what we did is to put the, the, the database in Docker so that there's a very quick install, but do not use the Oracle installation in production. It's only in order to get the quick start. You need to install the Oracle on a real VM or, or Oracle or any database, or, or using, for example, all the, uh, the uh, RDS uh, or equivalent on Google uh, environments so that you have something stable. Do not choose Docker for database in production. That, that, that doesn't work. And you also have the Fractalis plugin and the O0.com uh, identity as a service integration as being an option. So the quick start, and, and maybe that's the, the real achievement, is if you go on this tiny URL, I2B2 uh, Transmart, you'll see that there's instructions with four, four lines, four lines to be able to install all this right at the box. So because we are downloading a 20 gigabyte database, it takes, if you're on Harvard Networks, it takes half an hour to download it. But then in half an hour plus three minutes, in 33 minutes, you have the full interconnected system working without writing one line of code. So this is definitely 
uh, an achievement in order to make a lot of people starting to use it for real. And all this dockerized uh, uh, environment, you can then use it within your own institutions. That's the key point. You don't have to install it on your server anymore. You can use the dockerized version to do it, except for the database. But then, now we need your help. We need your help because now it's open, truly open source, where we need your contribution, we need your feedback to see what's working, what's not working. And so there's the roadmap where you can from the PMC, when you can help and participate if you're interested to join. We also created an open discussion forum to avoid one-on-one -on -one discussions or even by mail with mailing lists. With this, it's a discourse um, forum to enable to re uh, uh, share your experience of what's working and not what's working. And then, now, if, because if you want to learn more outside of just this high level presentation and learn from who actually did the work, because I didn't do anything, I'm just doing demos as my team tells me, you can, what we are organizing tomorrow is a, uh, a session where you can, a workshop in the TMEC rooms, where you can have one-on-one -on -one discussion with the full team of developers and half of the team of the postdocs that are available from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. by creating different booths. So it's a bit like Disneyland, where you have different tables, and there's seven tables that are available where you can go and meet with all those guys and having a direct interaction and asking, okay, how did you do this? What worked, what didn't work? The first table, for example, you can come with your laptop and in 45 minutes, you can have a full installation of I2B2 Transmart with the enhanced database running directly on your laptop. Or they can show you how to run it on the on Amazon or Google or, or Azure. And another another table is how to work and or on importing and tuning clinical data in the I2B2 Transmart database. Another one on security DevOps deployment using a HIPAA compliant cloud. Another one on the picture API Jupyter installation and using at a large scale. Uh, that's on the infrastructure part in the room TMEC 306, uh, which is a 260 long good medical area. So you have the information on the last page of your leaflet. But then there's another room where you can see example of biomedical research that we do in the lab, where using this infrastructure by the postdoc showing you uh, early peak before some of the papers being published or some published papers of how we are using this at scale of how to do large scale FIWAS analysis and longitudinal cluster analysis using the database or research projects using the picture API with Enhance and also to how to deploy a health cluster on Google Cloud uh, using and also using uh, doing deep learning analysis on autism variants uh, using Google Cloud. And so some of the uh, postdoc even created a, 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 a detailed workshop with instructions for you to actually go and, um, and start with example tutorial of how to do it. Uh, so it's really a question of for you to jump in. So it doesn't mean it's it, this oldest people will be standing there from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. But you just can come whenever you want to go to each table to go and jump that like in uh, Disneyland, but there's no fast pass. So it's really a question of when you first one arrive, first one to interact with um, all of them and then to uh, so that's why there's multiple people at each table, so that you can go and express your need, what you will need, what you want to learn more, uh, to create, uh, to make sure, because the key point is, you, we want you to use it. We want you to help us to improve it. So we had to do the heavy lifting to put everything together, but now it's yours in order to create with this open source version. So please, um, uh, Go and have a look at the roadmap and uh, please uh, help us by improving this project. Thank you. Yes. Microphone. And uh, embedded link to the actual notebook. Yes. In a real life scenario, you, you actually create your notebook with, let's say, Picture API yep. that's actually contacting um, the authenticated servers. You authenticate yourself, you fetch the data, you do analysis, right? Yep. And I publish it. 
But if you were to access the notebook and you want to reproduce, you can't access the actual APIs. How do you overcome that? So, for example, yes. very good question, where we published two notebooks because we were using two different data sets. Oops, here. Two reproducible use cases. One is on patient control data where you need to have an IV and the data use agreement, the Simon Simplex autism data set. So we show how we run the analysis, but if you are not authorized to access the system, you are not, you don't, haven't signed a data use agreement with the Simon Foundation, you won't be able to access it. That's why we also created the other Jupyter notebook, another use case using Enhance, which is totally publicly available because you're, you, I hope by the end of tomorrow you'll all have it running on your laptop. So that's where the, um, uh, there's an, uh, an API key, a token, that, and you, there's many of them that were generated that, are, that won't expire, that are available, and because it's completely open data. So it really depends on how, what was the consent of the patient in order to participate in the studies, and then to reflect of either having something closed where you need to be authenticated, or in this context of the picture API, where the token for the authentication is publicly available and explain how you get it in the public. Good. Yes. I think for I2P to transmart to have a prosperous future, it would be fantastic to have more and more users, more and more studies being accommodated. And I think you showed some essential steps in facilitating the ease of installation of I2P to transmart. Um, I think it's also important to have the next steps like easy data loading. Um, and um, also what is great is that you offer this study that people can start at the mining. Uh, it will be great if more and more studies become publicly available. If I yes. need to look in a, into another tool like CBioPortal, I open it, I can see a number of studies and start actually working without any prior knowledge. Yeah. This is the kind of level that I would like to see I2B to Transmart to proceed to. Um, and that in the end, journals like the New England would say, oh, you can publish your study, but of course you have to publish it in Transmart or see by a portal because then people can really use the data instead of going through a lot of efforts, etc. What are the steps that are needed to get there? How do you make sure that even though you left Europe and second, left Europe, I intend to stay, so as a European, how can I benefit from all these efforts as well? De well, definitely. Uh, thanks for this uh, enlightening uh, remark where definitely we need people uh, to use it, not just to create their own infrastructure, but to use it in real research studies. So that's why I started with this I2B2 disease page with all those driving biology projects uh, that have been extremely successful where the uh, in those papers, the line representing the underlying infrastructure is one or two lines in the method section. But the key is to show that this was useful to be able to actually uh, conduct the analysis. And so uh, it's really important that people are, that need it because you, you, no one wants to do busy work when it's not differently useful. It's really to, to make sure that if they use this, uh, if they install it, that they can use it for real. So I guess we need to still have some people who stay in Europe to take care of the continent. But um, other than that, I think that my practical response is, I think we have to disrupt from the bottom up. So I would start publishing in science reports and PLOS One and these open access journals and have your supplementary materials be an I2B2 database with a Jupyter notebook, uh, uh, notebook in it so that the reader can go to supplementary materials, see the Jupyter notebook and rerun the analysis. And um, I would talk to the people at Google Cloud and say, are you willing to uh, support this kind of functionality? I bet they'll be interested. So that's, I think, how you do it. 
And if you do it with a few of these journals, I think much faster than we think, the New England journals and the JAMAs and the Lancets will also begin to accept the supplementary, supplementary materials in that format. Because in the end, you're going to need structured databases with code bases to actually be able to understand the data, just putting it into one big uh, blog online for most people is too great a hurdle to overcome to realities. Any other questions? No, perfect. Thank you very much.